So, yeah, everybody knows already here what the better answer is and how powerful it is, how we can compute the uh, energies and eigenstates relatively easy as in past, but computing a uh, scalar approach is a little bit more involved. And in particular, in the context of the algebraic better ansatz. Well, in the coordinate better ansatz, you already have the wave function, so you only have to, to do the integral. And more or less, with some difficulty, you can do it. But in the algebraic better ansatz, it's a little bit more difficult because you don't have uh, the explicit form from the very beginning of the, of the wave function. So are you, are you assuming completeness of the better ansatz? A provocative question. Well, let's assume in this case, yes, but that's an issue I'm not going to enter. I, I prefer not to enter at the moment. But completeness was proven. Okay. For proof, completeness, okay. Well, no, I didn't prove it, but it's proven. For fundamental okay. in SUN only, right? So let's keep Yes, I'm going to talk mostly about SU, SU2, but some of the tools can be generalized to SUN. Even to give the form universal enveloping of SU, and I think there is one of the authors of that paper here, and I'm going to talk tangentially about that. Well, but going back to the introduction, I, mean, I don't have to explain to you the importance of knowing of knowing a scalar approach to compute correlation functions, form factors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm going to start from the very beginning, and the very beginning will be the article by Godin from 19, well, article is a book of 300 pages of 1972. Then I'm going to recap a little bit about the algebraic beta ansatz. I know everybody here knows about the algebraic beta ansatz, but I'm going to refresh a little bit the parts I'm going to be needing. Then I'm going to enter in the paper by Corepin of 1982, where everything started, well, where he starts giving a proof of how to compute of the norms of the vectors. And I'm going to talk about how to efficiently find recursion relations, uh, which is mostly in this paper by, yes, uh, I'm not going to be able to pronounce most of the names. The ASIC, I think, is here, Pakuliak, Ragusi, and Slavno from 2017. And using that idea, I'm going to show you the example of massless relativistic ads 3 r matrices which is done by me and Alessandro last year. And uh, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about why are we finding determinants in the, in the scalar proofs, which is from a paper by Samuel Belliard, which, is, which also is here, and uh, Slavno. So let me go with the Godin paper of 1972. Basically, a part of the six vertex model, eight vertex model, he studied in this, uh, this book, the Lip linear model, which is one dimensional beta gas with delta function interactions. Basically, this uh, is a Schrodinger, a Schrodinger problem. And you can solve that using the coordinate beta and sat. You find the usual form, the, play, the plane wave parts, the sum over uh, symmetric, symmetric combinations of the momentum, this per factor here that is related to the S matrix. And of course, you can compute the, he gives this formula for the normalization of those eigenvectors. With this G here being what we today know as the Godin determinant, although it's still written in, the, in this form of a product. And confusingly, the momentum and the position uh, live in this D. That, that is not my fault. It's already in the paper, this confusing notation. Where this, this ordering for the momentum and this ordering for the positions. This more or less, you can, you can prove it. You already have the form of the eigenfunction, so you, have, you just have to plug, plug it in the integral. Uh, this is what the integral of the, of the plane wave part gives you. With some properties under the symmetric, uh, the sum of the, uh, of the symmetrization of the momenta. So after a little bit of algebra, a very non-trivial uh, non and very tedious rewriting, you can prove the, that formula. It's not easy, but it's manageable. But let me go to the, to the part we are interested in, how to compute the scalar products in the algebra and beta ansatz. I'm going to review a little bit about that. So, 
The central part of the algebraic Betanzat is always the, the monodromic matrix, which is the product of the of last matrices, which depend on the on the spectral parameter and some set of inhomogeneities. You can write the monodromic matrix as these four operators, this A, B, C, and D. And the transfer matrix, which is the trace of the monodromic matrix, is the generating function of the conserved charge of the system associated to the monodromic matrix. So we can diagonalize this transfer matrix, we can diagonalize all the uh, conserved charts of the system simultaneously. These, three, these four operators, the A, B, C, and D, satisfy a set of commutation relations uh, that are codified in the, in the RTT relation here. Mostly I'm going to use these R matrix, these six vertex R matrix of different form, but at some point I will be, I will go in, I will go to do some weird things to these R matrix. So for example, instead of, of working in DSU2, I'm going to work in DSU1 slash one, but on view time, for the moment, I'm going to use this one. And uh, the commutation relations I'm going to be interested in are mostly these six here. That the transfer matrix commute with itself, the B operator commute with itself, the C operator commute with itself. You have this commutation relation between the B and the C, and the A and D, has this commutation relation, this first term, which is just the swapping of the two operators, a function here, this f here. And a second, uh, a second term, usually called the unwanted term, because a part of the swapping of the operators, you also have to uh, swap the arguments here. For example, here the a depends on the mu, here depends on the lambda, which is the argument of the b here. And for the d, you have also more or less the same structure. You have a wanted term, you have only the swapping of the operators and an unwanted term with, where you also have the swapping of the rapidities. Be careful because some people, when they define this F and G, they use different, completely different notations. For example, uh, uh, Fadeyev in how to use the, how the algebra ends, beta as it works, and the book by Bogoli, of Korpin and Isergit, they have uh, each the, this problem with the notation. One use one and the other use the opposite one. I don't remember which one uses use each, but they use the one the opposite of the other, which is always that's a problem. That's very universal equation, the last one. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's a very universal equation. For any equation. function of two variables, more or less. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So I'm going to assume that this is a pseudo vacuum, and, that's a, and it's an eigenvector of the transfer matrix. Then from that uh, pseudo vacuum, I can construct this state. Uh, I apply a stack of B uh, operators on the pseudo vacuum. And it's going to be an eigenvector of the transfer matrix with this eigenvalue, provided that the set of lambdas that I'm using here fulfill the beta equations, which uh, all of you know that they are non-trivial uh, non to solve and all that. Where this A and D are the eigen eigenvalues of the operators A and D uh, with the pseudo vacuum. So, uh, because uh, in most of the times the Hermitian conjugate of the B operator is going to be plus or minus the C operator, uh, computing a scalar proofs is just reduces to computing the this vacuum expectation values of B's and of C's and B's operator, which uh, to alleviate the number of products I'm going to have to write, I'm going to use this shorthand notation with a vector in the in the, in the arguments of the C and the B in the rapidities. And I'm going to distinguish th three kinds of scalar products. The off-cell, off-cell scalar products, where both sets of rapidities uh, do, not do not have to satisfy the beta equation, so they are arbitrary complex numbers. The on-cell, off-cell scalar products, where one of the two sets is going to fulfill the beta equation, and norms, where I'm going to take the limit, where both sets are the same, and this set is going to satisfy the beta equations. Apart from that notation, I'm going to use a little bit more of, of notation to alleviate my, the number of products I have to write. For example, this vector, I'm going to put it as subindex. When I want one of the rapidities not to appear, I'm going to use that the function of, this, of the vector means just the product of that function for all the elements of that set. When I have two, uh, two arguments, I'm going to, it's going to be the two products. I put this 
less or equal or greater than that, less or greater than that, is going to be the product with the restriction that the that I'm only going to get this argument less than this one. In the sense that this is going to be, for example, if I have two, this is only going to be f of one, two. This is going to be f of two, one, but this one is going to be one, 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 two, two, one, and two, two. Okay, now, how do you compute the scalar products? Well, you can do the brute force computation. You just take the, this scalar product, take the C and the D and the B that are in the middle, apply this commutation relation, you get some A's, some D's, you commute the A's and the D's to the B operators. But that, as you can imagine, is going to be difficult and it's going to escalate very out of control very quickly. And to prove my point, I have this table here of how much time takes Mathematica to do that compu those computations. For example, if I give a, for one, two, three, four, and five exc excitations, uh, the time it takes for, if I give numerical values of the rapidities, if I give them random values for one and two and three, it's not going to take much time. For four excitations, it's already taking a little bit of time, but for five excitations, it's, it already takes two and a half hours to compute your, the scalar probe. So it escapes out of control very quickly. But sometimes we don't want, we want the explicit expression. We don't want the, the numer numerical values. I, I want to know how it depends on the rapidities. Well, I can put this symbol, I can compute symbolically. And I have no issue for one and two. For three or four, you see that it's already taking the three times the time it takes to do the numerical one. I didn't do the five phase citations because I don't want to be there for seven or eight hours waiting for the result. But still, this is going to give you the, all the terms separately. You want to simplify the, that a little bit. So you put in top of that the uh, simplify in Mathematica, which is, of course, one of, the worst, one of the best and the worst functions at the same time. The best because it's going to give you more or less simplified answer, and the worst because it's going to take a long time. You can already see here. For two excitations, it's more or less instantly, but when you put the simplify, it's already taking like two and a half seconds. And for three excitations, it's already giving you errors that is taking a long time. Uh, can you precise uh, what uh, model, what states do you consider? Uh, in this case, it was just a uh, SE2, the usual XXX SE2. Oh, I mean, uh, periodic boundary conditions? Uh, well, I. I'm not, I'm not substituting better with this uh, off cell of cell just by doing commutation relations. Okay. I can show you later the, the program if you want. And symbolic means uh, compute big matrix B, apply it five times, compute big matrix C, apply it five times, press uh, simplify and hope mathematical do something? No, it's basically a, a, substitu a, a substituting a commutation relations. When you find a C with a B, just substitute that expression by B, C plus this A, D plus D plus A, D. So an, another question, what, what is the definition of off shell? And off shell in this uh, here. Yeah, why, why, why are you using this definition? Uh, so I can think about other definition we should give determinant expression immediately, which would also coincide with uh, beta vectors on shell. Uh, or, well, uh, if you use B good instead of B and C, in both cases, you, you just get determinant immediately. Right, and uh, it will mm -hmm. have all this property that if you set the beta root on shell, it will still give you the eigenstate of the transfer matrix. So why this definition is like physically motivated to use the BC? Well, because I was wor I was working with the just the algebraic better and that I didn't. Yeah, but uh, it's I it algebraic. Uh, so B good is just yes. a linear combination of B and C, right? So instead of just uh, using pure B, use like a linear combination B of C or like Dima likes to take just A instead, whatever. So and they will all have the same property that on the beta vectors. On, uh, on the beta roots, which is why beta under equations, it will give you the eigenstate of transfer matrix. At the same time, it is always determinant, even if they don't satisfy the beta equation. Well, that's something I have to look more into. 
but sorry, do you know what the complex, what their mission conjugate of be good is then? Is there a C good? Yeah, well, first uh, there is a C good, but in, in the case of what you do, C good is B good. I see. But that's a good question. Do you know the Hermitian conjugate of the B good? Y yes. Okay. So it, it's not necessarily a Hermitian conjugate, but uh, there is a, it's uh, something we call C good. As you well, remember, because, of course, from because the, with these ones you have already this the Hermitian of the B to get the C. Mm -hmm. But again, for SU two purposes, uh, C good is B good. So yeah, there's no difference between B and C. But at some point, I want to go out of the of the SU two. Yeah, and, and uh, there again, you is there is something. It is determinant straight away. Well, we will we will see the other weird R matrices I'm going to look at. So, uh, so constructive part of my question is, is whether there is any physical motivation to define this as your off-shell vectors with B, because there are many uh, definitions of what is off-shell vector, right? This is like any construction which becomes yeah, for, a beta for, vector once you restrict your beta roots, which depend on beta roots and become beta, actual beta vector on the beta roots. So there are billions of definitions one could think of, right? You can add some something which would vanish on the B times us. Well, if for example, in this in this one, which is the off cell on cell of cell, you will find that this is also, you can write this kind of beta vectors at the, uh, as determinants. No, the right, but, uh, no, my yeah. question is about uh, significance of this notion of off shell vector. It, is it like does it have some yeah there there is a, there is some there is some reason to use this kind of off cell of a uh, because you will at some point you find these off cell on cell off cell beta vectors where you have one set of your one set the fulfilling the beta equations and the other don't don't fulfill it yeah on this point uh, is something i don't really understand because for s2 at this what s2 or s2 but this um, this off shell, if you consider big wood, you have this part plus many other terms that all vanish when you take uh, on shell. Uh, yes. And this, we, we show this uh, with Nikita in some paper. Um, but at the end, uh, you should have this contribution plus many, many other terms that will disappear when you put the uh, off shell. Uh, the, um, yeah, or you can just change your definition of off shell. <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> sure. well, my question is which <laughs> definition is better? So I prefer the one with big good, obviously, right? So, <laughs> there is a little bit of bias there. Yeah. No, no, no. There sorry, is sorry, a very, very special choose of partial beta vectors. It's great in the presentation theory. Only exactly this form has very nice uh, properties. So if you split your distribution into parts, then you can write one of these. One beta vectors in terms of, of, of parts, this formula, which we should call coproduct formula, it's very, very, very special and very, very concrete choosing of, of shell with beta vector. And only this choosing give you very nice algebraic properties of uh, scalar products and stuff like this. Well, so, what could be nice with property is uh, having determinant at the end. That's the nicest property one can dream of, right? <laughs> no, no. I don't understand what you say. You have a generalized story. It uh, gives you some very, very deep restrictions, which is absolutely not, not clear. It yeah, so I, I'm trying to understand what are the physical conditions on uh, off-shell vector which makes this choice particularly significant? Uh, only what we call the two, two sets model, two sides model, or multiple sides model. We, we, it's, it's a physical rewriting of coproducts sort. When you split your spin chain into, into parts, you, you can rewrite a beta vector of whole spin chain in terms of beta vectors of each part, some very special sum over partitions. Yes, but, I'm, I'm going to talk about that later. Yeah, but I mean, this sum gives you very, very special and very, very concrete form of beta vector, of shell beta vector. So there is one choose. There is no very huge uh, generalized. But if you try to understand, to learn spin change from point of view representation theory. But um, 
this into SH, you can use another construction suppose. Oh, for splitting spin chain into two pieces, uh, is it a, like a theorem that it's uh, only this B version uh, gives you nice coproduct, or you can do something else? Uh, it's I, some kind, maybe no, not exactly theorem, but it's very, very, very observation. But I, I guess if you use A instead of B, right, it will still have the, the same nice property of decomposition into some. No, you haven't uh, some kind of uh, shelf structure of the T vector. So you need some charge uh, at, at each, I mean, shelf. So you need some, some over uh, flipped magnons at each layer. And you, when you use your the good uh, structure, you, you lost this property. You have to come, uh, come back to, uh, to initial paper. Sorry, Samuel, I think you disappeared somehow. Yeah. I disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's just that you are back now. Yeah, try again. Yeah, well, I, I just say that this. Uh, this uh, coproduct structure of the B, this is something that we just connected for the quantum just at algebraic level, and that you have representation theory, I guess what. And what is uh, what to choose, what is the I guess what vector? And uh, if you have the I guess what vector and the coproduct, you have these two sides or multi site uh, formula that in some sense map the beta vector on the wave function of beta. And this is uh, in paper of Tarazov. Uh, in many papers, in fact, and this is a way to, to make the correspondence between uh, uh, the beta wave function and the beta vector and say that they are exactly the same object just writing in a different way. And the point is at the end, you, you, you need to have, a, uh, when you choose the representation, you should be sure that it's eigenstates in terms of, uh, of vector and with number inside. And so all the, all, all the, uh, all those, um, which writing should finish at the same point. And so when you use B good, you have this composite, this uh, twist matrix, and it's not clear what is the off structure of the B good when you have this coproduct on B good to have, uh, to have this same uh, trick that uh, use uh, <coughs> and Kita and others in, uh, in their way of proving uh, some formula for scalar products. Sorry, so you mean that this off-shell beta vector is uh, some part of uh, ansatz for so for, for Cassette equation of Tarasov function of construction, yeah? Yeah, this beta vector, it's a, uh, yeah, of course, it's a part. I mean, only this st structure, when you oh, use be good, you can yeah. write this one. Okay, sorry. Uh, when you use be good construction, you can't use this off-shell beta vector as part of uh, ansatz for a solution of causal well, equation. Okay. And if you make the transformation to, to, to be good, uh, I don't know what is exactly the action of the coproduct on this uh, vector. If you if you, you think it in terms of uh, algebra, not in terms of co-presentation, you take be good and you, you act with coproduct on it. And could we have a close formula to, to have this and add some uh, similar property that the, the action of the coproduct on beta vector? And then on uh, representation, so you have different map embedding. But this, uh, <coughs> I am not good to explain anything with the Maybe. blackboard <laughs> in, uh, the because it's getting super advanced. It's better if we, if, for people who are not familiar, if we go on for the seminar and then at the end, yeah, 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 yeah maybe, maybe it's better. Well. And they go into the, the paper by Korepin in the, from the 82. So basically, uh, the paper starts giving you the form of the, of the norm of, the, of a vector vector. And after that, he gives you this theorem. You define this function f, which is the norm of a vector vector divided by these functions here, with lambda fulfilling the beta equation. He also defined this x here as the derivative of the logarithm of a divided by d. Then if the following five properties are fulfilled, then this F is related to the is the determinant of the is the determinant, which is the determinant of the derivative 
logarithm of the Bethe equation. He proves this, uh, this theorem by induction, and most of the time, uh, computing scalar products is at the end uh, reversed by proof by induction. So, what are the five properties if uh, this F should fulfill? This invariant and the swapping of the rapidities and this X variable, which is more or less obvious from the symmetry properties of the B and the functions are involved here. That depth is linear in this X one variable, the one for the for the first rapidity. Sorry, and when that, you say when you say swapping, you mean that you swap yeah, lambda you, between you inter, themselves. You interchange you don't the, swap lambda with X. No, I, I mean they, uh, separately, the lambdas with lambdas and x's with x's. Well, and this, uh, this proportionality with the x1 should be this f uh, modified. Basically, is you take this f, you get rid of lambda 1, but you have to modify your definition of a and d so your beta equation remain the same. So because in the product of the beta equation doesn't appear now the lambda 1, you have to put it by hand in the A and the D. Uh, sorry, can you slide my case slightly slower? Uh, I think the first slide we see is the letter X, capital X. Yeah, here. Uh, so if you just focus a little bit on this letter and how F depends on it, it will be easier to understand uh, five properties. Uh, well, uh, the first one and the fifth one is, uh, they are very obvious from the dependence of F. No, but uh, so you see, you see, you see, x is, is basically a function of lambdas to to what I see. So how well, you say that f is function of x is well, not clear. Uh, uh, basically, uh, there is an issue. If if you fix uh, your lambdas, you can change your x freely. So is uh, x is like uh, energy per uh, magnet? Is it? Yeah, in some sense, is the. Yeah, it's related to your to your transfer matrix in some sense. It's not exactly that, but it's related to it. But it's not clear how x is the independent of lambda from what you wrote. For me, no, it's a function of lambda. Uh, it's a function of lambda, but if you fix your lambdas, you can always change your monodromic matrix in a in a way that you can you can freely change the value of your x. So it changes a you change a and d then or what? Yes, exactly. It depends on, on lambda, but you can also see it as depending on A and D, and you can move A and D freely. And what about, what does it mean swapping X then? Uh, in the sense that I can, I can swap what the X1 with X2. And, and so this is related to, the, to your swapping of rapidities. No, I mean, uh, I'm still do not understand how lambda and X are independent, because if you change A and D, it's like, uh, it's how many parameters? Uh, lambdas is uh, like number of magnums, but yeah, number but of they are they are independent in that sense that you can manipulate a and d without changing your. For right. I think you have a, a fix. Uh, a and d there is one a and one d for the whole uh, set of magnums, and you you want to change only one x. Uh, only one lambda. Yeah. Yes. So then, uh, if you change a and d, all x's will change. I don't see how that's defined. I think technically it arises when you use beta equations, right? So yeah, it's like it's like the derivative uh, of the yeah. So you it's, get formally you need to resolve uh, zero divided by zero, and this is the remnant. So yeah, yes, it's, yeah, it's something like that. It's, uh, yeah, it's computing uh, this derivative around around your bit uh, around your. Uh, yeah, around your beta, well, your solutions of the beta equations, but you are freely to to modify that one by defining the your a and b. My comment is this Yes. Usually we call it generated model. It means we assume that a and d is some general uh, f function parameter. You can use is this a and d? It's a free function, but no. it's some very strong uh, restriction nevertheless you can imagine that you have spin chain with a lot sides and a lot in homogeneous you have lambdas and homogeneous side is usually and um, you have a lot of parameters which you, you can uh, shift independently so okay. you, you have equality of some rational functions and assume that you 
can somehow shift your oxide. Uh, I mean, on homogeneities, stay the same uh, lambdas, but at the same time, uh, shift your x to any your point if you want. So right. in some sense, you have enough freedom to have uh, independent, take independently parameter lambda of lambda p and a of lambda p. It's somehow assume of uh, correctly in, in this paper. So maybe it will be useful to understand how many lambdas are there. Well, uh, at the end, you can do number of lambdas as well as a number of sides. So, and you have enough inhomogeneities to move axes independently. That's so, yeah. num number of lambdas is not number of magnums; it's uh, length of spin chains. Then. No, 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 no. Lambda is n, and uh, no. it's exactly number of uh, spin. Uh, so you're exactly shifting along each side, right? So, lambda is number number of lambdas, number of magnums. Yes. Yeah. And number of axes. Also, yeah, number of you magnums. Have, you have yeah. to, yes, you should have the same. But in homogeneities, there are as many homogeneities as length of spin chain. Yeah, yeah. So there are more in homogeneities, so you can so always. In some yes. sense, you can use A and D some free function. Yes. Because you have a lot of uh, freedom hiding in, in homogeneities. Can you rewrite F cleanly in terms of axis? Yeah, for example, you have here the property 2. We have here that f should be a linear function of this axis. But what, why, what's so special about x1, not x2? Because they are the same. So well, it should be. That's, the, that's the thing. You write it linearly on x1, but you know that this has to be linear on all the axes from property 1. That says that it should be invariant under exchange in the axis. So you <laughs> only have to study is, one of them. If it's symmetric over all axes, so Second axiom, it's somehow generally. Yeah, exactly. Of, if, it's of, of if it's symmetric under all axes, you have to only to study one to know what is the behavior with respect to the other ones. Uh, well, for how f is defined now, we do not understand how f is depend on does depend on x. Well, uh, if you have a part of this, uh, you can think as f depending on x, as depending on the well. It's hidden so, here in your when you take the. So, so, so you already, you already know that over. you are getting the. Unclear. So x p equals to the derivative log. So this right yeah. hand side is some explicit function of lambda. You can solve you, lambda. You can see it from from already lambda. knowing your knowing your answer. Your f is going to be the dependent on the on the norm of the of this uh, vector, and you know that this has to be the, the, the proportional to the determinant of the Godin the term of the Godin matrix, and that involves the derivative of this a and this you can see that you have here the dependence on x hidden here in this day in this norm no i think juan dima is asking that uh, if you take the property two you demand that the f yeah so you you demand that f uh, so supplies this linearity for all, all the cartage of x but the uh, you, you you have it, it should satisfy for the Victorial depends, but not like, for example, you have in the property five, you have this dependent, but how does it actually enter for, for, for the initial uh, expression of f of lambda? No, this is for particular yeah. values. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, he, it's hidden here. You, you, it's hidden okay. here in your, in your norm. Okay. That's the idea. That's why I say knowing, knowing already what your final answer is, you can see that it's hidden here. Oh, my, okay, I don't understand fully. Maybe we should move on. But uh, my uh, comment is that if you know the final answer, this final answer is not unique as a function of beta root because you can always uh, add some expression which vanishes on shell, right? Yes, but that's why this is the... So f is a function the, of lambda, I don't quite understand because lambdas are not independent variables. They're, they're okay, they depend on homogeneities, but it's very, I mean, you should explain this a bit better, but hopefully it's not the main point. I'm uh, sorry. Well, is this off shell? No, this is, is uh, it's here. The lambdas they are fulfilling the better equations. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry, okay. So this final equation, uh, f is uh, kappa to the n 
uh, derivative with lambda j, should it be lambda k or is this lambda j? Uh, which one? Here. And this is yeah. correct or not? Yeah, it's, this is lambda j here and lambda k here. Okay. Why? Uh, well, you have to compute this at the determinant of this matrix with J and K. Oh, yeah, that's true. Okay, thanks. So, A over D is E to the I P L. Yes. So, when you differentiate, X will be proportional to the volume. So, mm. it's basically I yes. times P prime times the volume. Yes. So, somehow this X keeps, keeps track of the volume factors. Yes, yes, that's true, for example. Okay, the thing is for properties two and three, uh, which at the end are a recurrence relation for the F. It's telling you how the F behaves from the, for, for example, N better roots to an F that depends only on N minus one, because you are erasing here the lambda one. To understand those, uh, we need uh, to go a little deep into the properties of scalar products. And one of the more useful is to rewrite your scalar product in this way, as a sum over partitions of your rapidities. This sum over partition basically is uh, it's accounting for rapidity C that can end into this A or in D, and the same for this rapidity D that can end on this A on this D. This relation is uh, it's something you can see already from the commutation relations. Basically, you start commuting A's and C's and D and B's until you only get A's and D's. And they have always to appear in the, in the same number. Because when you commute a C with a B, you get a D and an A. And because the commutation relations of A's and D's do not change their number when they commute through the C's, you always have uh, the same numbers of A's and D's. And you have to put here a function Kn that takes into account all these f's and g's that you get from the from the commutation relations. So at the end, this k, it's only going to depend on the R matrix. So it's not going; it's going to depend only on the R matrix and not on the on the monodromic matrix you are using. What does that mean? That this k is going to be independent of the length of your spin chain. It's going to be independent on the homogeneities you are in homogeneities you are using. And it's going to be independent even of the functions A and D you are using. So that's uh, that's a lot of independence of the K of this Kn. So we can use that in our advantage to find the particular values of these Kn's. And that's what Corpin does. He takes, for example, the inhomogeneous trigonometric six vertex model, where A and D uh, are defined as the product of this uh, hyperbolic sign. And he picks a very particular values of the inhomogeneities. In particular, this lambda c's, all the lambda c's plus i eta. Uh, and in that case, what is going to happen is when you have one lambda c appearing in a d, in these somewhere partitions, that term is not going to contribute. So the only term that is going to contribute in this sum over partition is the one where all the lambda c's are in the lambda a's and all the lambda b's are in the lambda t's. And you get only one term of the sum of partitions. Now the thing is to find this scalar plot by other means. This is usually called the, in the literature the highest weight. You can also compute the lowest weight by using here the lambda b instead. And in general using any set of lambdas you can pick one of the of the KNs by this method. So, how can you also compute this uh, scalar plot by other means? Well, the idea by Corepin is say, well, these KNs are also independent of the length of your spin change. Why I don't get exactly the one where the length is equal to the number of excitations? In that case, I can compute it through the so-called uh, domain world partition function. Basically, it's the is the matrix element between the, the this state of vacuum that in this case is the tensor product of all these spins down, a stack of B operators and the state with all the spins up. In that time, this, this was more or less understood and he was able to write the, to prove the properties two and three from properties of the, 
of this uh, domain word partition function. But I'm not going through this part because later I'm going to talk about a uh, better way to compute uh, this record resolution for scalar products. So at the end, properties one and five are more or less obvious from the, apart from the issues we are having with the axis from the, from the form of the, of the function. Properties two and three and consequences of these, of these um, record resolutions. Property four are more, are a bit odd and depends on what these X are. So Can maybe I'm going to skip that. What, what they are. Eh? Can you just remind the Yes, word? of course. Yeah, the properties one and five are basically that the F is invariant and they're exchanging these lambdas and exchange of this X separately. The five is that when you have only one excitation, this F is equal to X. The two and three were these properties that uh, is basically a reference relation of how to compute this F. And the fourth is that F is equal to zero if you put all these X's equal to zero for a fixed value of the lambdas. And maybe I'm going to skip the part when I prove the property four because it's going to be even more confusing. So let me go to how to compute these recurrence relations. From this, based, based on this paper for, the answer is, is already here. So it's the, we have one, one author if I say something wrong. So you can interrupt me if I say something weird. So the idea is taking uh, the definition of the monomial matrix as a product of lax matrices and split the, the product into two, pro two different products. So I can write my monodromy matrix as the product of two monodromy matrix instead, two smaller ones. This is usually called the composite model or the two side generalized model. So what is going, to, well, from that, I can write my B operator and my C operators here in, the, in my original monodromy matrix as product of A, B, C, and D operators of the smaller monodromy matrices. This way, for example, the B is the a of the first one times the B of the second one plus the B of the first one and the D of the second one. Some people will, re will remember this from the coproduct of the B operators and the coproduct of the C operators, and it's because they are related in some way. So this is telling us how to split one B operator. But what happens when I have two? Well, I just have to apply this, this splitting two times. If I apply to the pseudo vacuum, what I get is that is these four terms. The op these operators in the first uh, monolith matrix will commute with the ones on the second monolith matrix. So we can take these A's already to the right hand side and apply them to the pseudo vacuum. But here we have an A1 and a B1. So I have to use uh, the RTT relations to commute this A through this B. And when I do that, it already commutes through this B2 and this D2 with no problem. And similarly with this D here. And if I apply the RTT relations, this is the final answer I get. I only get ter uh, wanted terms here and here, and the unwanted terms all cancel. This is what Andre was, say was saying before, that when you have these uh, beta vectors here, you will, you will split them into beta vectors also. And uh, you can generalize it to a general number of, uh, of B operators. You will have to split this into two sets, this beta and beta bar, which, uh, with empty intersection. And you will get this weight, which accounts for these Fs here, and A's and D's, coming from these A's and D's, and some factors of B in the first monoring matrix and some factors in the second monoring matrix. And Sorry, so this, this statement is true only on shell, right? Uh, no, if you see, I, I didn't use the beta equations at any point to get this answer. It's true only off shell, actually. Because if you suppose each, any vector will, at the start, is on shell, then you destroy this on shellity after your coproduct operation. Yeah, I can imagine because if you have on cell here, you will get off cell vector vectors here. 
So you can do similarly for the C operators and put everything together and write the scalar product as a sum over partitions, different from the kind of sum over partitions we had before, because now I have to split this lambda C into gamma and gamma bar and lambda B into beta and beta bar. But I have a two scalar products with less or equal number of excitations. Do you have intuition why unwanted term cancels? Like not, not just saying like they compute they cancel, but is there like a nice argument for that? Uh, I don't have one. Maybe Andre has one for that. Why they cancel? Or they stay? So you have four terms, or no one of them will not cancel? There is no any canceling. They all still alive. Yeah, they create the sum over partition. Yes, so you have four terms in the right hand side, so... Yes, but you would have expected like six from, some from the wanted terms and some from the unwanted terms. But you have all possible um, expected combination in the right hand side. You have all possible bees with all possible arguments. Well, that's true. Can you just go back one slide uh, to see yes. what? No, no, one more. Ah, okay, so it was uh, just A, B, and D from the B. Yes, Sorry. because I'm split just the Bs. So no. it shouldn't, uh, a, D, a C shouldn't appear there. So this is uh, this type of formula when you split the chain. Uh, this was like known before, right? This paper. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Sorry, can you explain what you mean and want to turn on the next slide? Uh, when you commute the A with the B, that you get the F uh, and, and the F the and the and G. You get but two terms. But you actually have this term, so there is no any cancelling. You have just combinatorial factor, you have two terms which add to another term in the sum. So there is no any cancel in some sense. No, no, no. So when you compute A and B, you get F and G. Maybe that yes. is what Then you recombine it with other terms. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is no any But, but the G you disappears. It's not disappearing since you have le less number terms. You have uh, just some combinatorial factor in another place. Yeah, it might, maybe, maybe there is maybe. no G here. There are only yes, F. Yes, I, I remember yeah, maybe it disappeared from G. G. Well, yes, in that sense. Ah, okay. <laughs> no, no, no but the, not... this F is the usual F from the from the RTT from the commutation relation. I I remember that the G disappears maybe from the anti-symmetry of the G. Actually, unwanted terms. It's not about this. So there is all terms is wanted. You have you want to have all the, all the terms. Well, I think we can we can still go with with uh, continue with this maybe. Well, now the idea is that you can take your scalar plots and substitute the the trick by Corepin as writing your scalar plots in terms in terms of a's and d's and these kn's. And pick a very particular again a very particular choice of your a's and d's because we know that in this case these kn's are independent of your choice of a's and d's. I'm going to take some of the lambda c's. I'm going to call, I'm going to call them gamma hat, and some of the lambda b's. I'm calling them beta hat, such that the number of lambda hats and beta hats is the total number of excitations. And pick my a of the first uh, monolinear matrix such that it vanishes from these lambdas that go into lambda hat, and the A of the second monolinear matrix vanishes in this in the piece of the beta hat. Sorry, that is way, what is known as freezing trick, right? Uh, in some sense, yes, it's some kind of the freezing trick. But that is uh, the important thing is that I'm going to get from the uh, scalar product here. I'm going to get only one term, which is this one here. But in the right-hand side, I'm also going to take only one term, 
because these weights depend on the on the A1, A2 in the case of, la, of the weight C, of the Cs and on A1 in the case of the weight of the Bs. So I'm only going to get also just one term. And I can relate these K, general Kns to lowest weight and highest weights. So, sorry, could you remind actually what we are computing because I'm a bit lost. Well, we, we want to compute this scalar approach, but I can write this scalar approach instead of the of this KNs. Yeah, but, uh, on shell, on shell, on shell of shell, or shell of shell, which one? At this moment, I'm not using I'm not apply, using uh, the better equation. So at the end, what I'm going to get is shell of shell. Of shell. Mm -hmm. So and these KNs, I can write them as in terms of these highest weights. And how do I compute the highest weights? Well with more recurrence relations. And one of the best way, uh, and the idea is that I can apply, I can take one of the C's and commute through the stack of all the B operators. So I'm going to take from here, from this result, only the part that is going to contribute to the highest weight. And for example, this third term, I already have one of the lambda n, I have my lambda in the A, and I would want it to be in the D. So that is not going to contribute to my highest weight. So I can safely already ignore that term and take only these two, fir these two first terms. But I can also use that this expression should be symmetric on, the, on all the lambdas. So I can compute here in the right hand side only the terms the term accompanying the product of the b's from 1 to n minus 1 and use this symmetry to compute the remaining ones so i can already ignore this one and i only have to compute this one in a, an unwanted term through the b's so the contribution i'm going to get to the highest weight the only part of this C commuting, commuted through this B that is going to contribute from the high, to the highest weight with this weight of the Bs here, with this form of the Bs here, is going to be this one. And just if I want the rest, I have to sum over, instead of putting here lambda n, putting each one of the other lambdas. So at the end, I have this recurrence relation for the highest weight. The only issue you can see that is not uh, the symmetry of the lambda c's is not obvious from here because lambda lambda n of lambda c n it's a uh, favor in some way, but the final answer should be symmetric under a change of these lambda c's also. And a similar one can be compute, can be done for the lowest weight, but it's better to use symmetry arguments to get them because you have to compute them only one of them. So. At the end, what, I, what do I have to do? So first, I have to solve the recurrence to compute a general of cell of cell. Now I'm saying it explicitly. I have to solve the recurrence relation for my highest weight. With that, I can substitute it into the KN. And with that, I can substitute into the scalar pros and perform all the sums I have, which is going to be non-trivial. But that's something you can do. So let me do, uh, well, I think it's already 12. We can wait a little, we can rest a little bit and I can do the particular example after the after the the rest. Okay. We are having a 10 minute break, coffee break, right? Yes. That's no smoking, only coffee or tea. Okay, that, that's a good idea. So let's uh, come back in five minutes. Okay. Well, see you all in five minutes. Yeah, can I ask maybe a yes. question to, to, to the previous discussion? So basically, uh, so, so, so discussion is, so if you use be good, then you don't, uh, uh, then you will not have this property that uh, uh, be or, of uh, like big chain splits and this uh, nice uh, uh, sum of partitions for two big goods. 
So this well, property would be I'm lost. I'm not right? sure about it because like be good is what is just a rotated version of B, right? So just uh, locally uh, conjugated to that. Yeah, yeah, I'm I, 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 I multiplying to B so will still apply. I just don't know how nice it will be there. Ah, uh, uh, so you're saying so there will be some of partition, but maybe coefficients will be a bit. So yeah. the problem is uh, B, B good doesn't uh, necessarily preserve number of magnets, uh, right? So whereas B is, uh, increases number of magnets each time it applies by one. Yeah, if you, find, if you find that B good has some property of this kind, mm -hmm. then all, this, all the tricks here, you, you can apply all the tricks here. So I just uh, think the number number of magnets uh, could change. So it will be probably some of our partitions, but not uh, some roots could like maybe disappear. I don't know, something like that. Actually, you have something like this only in general two case, but nevertheless you have. You will be you'll be good loss your saving of charging, but you have uh, in left hand side some sum over. Uh, each shell from one to infinity. Yeah, it, uh, it will come. Actually, to... but there is problem because in this case, your vector vector will be sum over all shells from from empty up to yeah, but limit. still so when you put roots on shell, it will be all these other sectors will be killed. So I yes, agree. You lose this property that the number of magnets is conserved, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, you're right. If you have it close uh, to shell, it will still uh, be concentrated around the right number of magnets. Your be good construction is very good at the on shell level, but at the off shell level, you have some over all shells. So yeah, but why is it bad? That's my question. <laughs> because you can't do anything with this uh, construction. You can't. Uh, you haven't any commutation relation. You haven't any. No, I mean, be, be good, uh, C good, D good, A good, they satisfy exactly the same system of commutation relations. Because it's rudiment of gel 2 case. And it's coincidence, actually. Uh, well, but we are discussing SU2 now. So for SU2, what would be the difference? Well, now I'm going to move to, to something more weird, which is this, this R matrix here. Just a question. So, be good is diagonalizable, right? Uh, it's not an important thing. It yes. doesn't kill. Yes, it is diagonalizable. Yeah. So the construction of Scranion then applies nicely. But also, it creates states the same way as B does. Uh, so then both. But there is no state which is killed, right? There is nothing which is killed by it. No, it's diagonalizable, right?
Okay, I think we can restart. Okay. So welcome back everyone. Now I'm going to go to apply the construction I've told you before to a very particular uh, R matrices. These are the ones for the massless relativistic limit of ADS either in the case of pure Ramon-Ramon or a mixture of Ramon-Ramon and NSNS fluxes. I'm going to go first with the with this this one and if I have time I will comment a little bit on this one. It depends on how much time I have. These two were derived in the by by Andrea Fontanella, also Sachs uh, Botan, who is here and Alessandro who is also here, I think. And uh, for this first R matrix, these are the commutation relations I need. In this case, this seems like uh, SU1 slash 1, a trigonometric SU1 slash 1, but it's not exactly that. Because, for example, you have your transfer matrix that is A minus D instead of A plus D, uh, but your B and C operators commute instead of anti commute. But still, you can perform the, uh, the same trick. And also, the, the Hermitian conjugate or your B operator define, has to be defined now with the super trace. It's an extra minus sign to get the, everything to work. It's a still a C operator. You have to play a little bit with the inhomogeneities, but as long as your inhomogeneities have imaginary part minus pi halves, you should have the same, the same kind of, uh, of a spin chain. So the recurrence relation for the highest weight, in this case, reads like that. It's pretty simple, it's more or less simple, but it can be simplified more if we do this uh, rewriting of the highest weight. After that, this recurrence relation becomes just the Laplace expansion of a determinant. So we get this determinant here for this, some sort of unrest highest weight. But we can do even more. We can do even better. Because we can use this uh, property of the trigonometric functions and the fact that the, uh, the determinant uh, doesn't change if I take one column and substitute it by the linear combination of the, of the same column and another one. And the highest weight can be, can be reduced to this factor and 
a determinant of the hyperbolic second, which can be reduced even more because the hyper, this determinant of the hyperbolic second behaves more or less like a, like a Cauchy matrix, a hyperbolic version of the Cauchy matrix. So at the end, can be rewritten in this way, and the highest weight is as a product of these three factors with some signs in front. With that, and the form of the weights, in this case, we have to be careful because we are working in well, our tensor product is graded, so we get extra minus signs when computing these weights. But we can substitute them in the in this expression for the Kn. And with that, we can sum these Kn's with these with A's and D's and get the expression for the scalar product, which even more surprisingly is just a determinant. And the important thing is that I've not used the, the beta equations at any point of the step. So this is an off-cell, off-cell uh, scalar product. And uh, it can be done very similarly to the other R matrix. The thing is that this is more, is more involved. Particular, for example, because the B operators do not commute anymore. They have this extra factor here. The problem is the definition of the B dagger is not trivial. We don't have, like before, that the B dagger is related to the C. This is because of what this uh, LL that I haven't said before means. The, in this uh, relative, in this much less relativistic limit, you have the left movers and the right movers. And when you put, and you, when you do the Hermitian conjugation, one of these left movers become a right mover. You have uh, to introduce this R matrix now with right and left movers instead of left and left movers. And there is a really, and this is the relation between one and the super, super transpose or the other. You can still go a little bit around this, defining two transfer two different transfer matrices with the same physical space, but a different auxiliary space. One is going to have uh, the auxiliary space with left movers and the other is going to be with right movers. And then the Hermitian conjugate of the B operator, of one of the transfer of the monolony matrices, is going to be the complex, the a complex conjugate of the B of the other transfer matrix. You can, with that, you can do more or less, you can symmetrize your states and work with that. And you can more or less do the same process. And at the end of the day, your scalar product can also be written in terms of a determinant. We have written this alpha and delta to be the equivalent of the A and B in these other uh, spin chains, the other one we have to introduce. And even if we is, uh, take away the, the symmetrization factors, this car puts is still a determinant. So, sorry, the question. question. Yes. Uh, so, before, uh, the, before the break, uh, you showed us this result in terms of sum over partitions, but there you don't have the determinant in general? No, but at the end you can perform, uh, like for example, in this case, with this, this is the, for the first R matrix even this form of this case, to substitute with your sum over partitions and miraculously that sum over partitions transform into a determinant. But uh, is this uh, general or what does the miracle depend on? Well, that's where it's going to be the last part of this talk. Okay, okay. Which is going, which I'm going to go now. So, that's the that's the punchline. What why do we get determinants? Why are we getting determinants if we got five? Why these some other partitions which involve very weird and not trivial functions here can be at the end rewritten re re in terms of determinants? And that was more or less answered in this paper by Slavnov and, and Samuel Beliard, who is, who is also here. 
uh, before you go to this, can I ask one more question about yes. the previous part? Uh, so this example, which is like SU1 slash 1, but not quite. Yes, yes it's, uh, it's similar, but not exactly. Um, well, if I start pl playing the game of writing transfer matrices and different representations, yes. uh, beta equations, I don't know, Hirota, mm -hmm. I mean, all this stuff, uh, what will be the difference? Well, you can see already at the level of computation relations, for example. That uh, if well, it would, I, uh, yeah, I, I don't, that's something I, th I imagine that Bogdan or Alessandro will be will be more fit to to answer because they have, I think they have studied a little bit the the TBA of, of these R matrix. But can you even do something like a rotor? Right? Does this R matrix become a projector at some point? Um, Yes, it's some, uh, if you put the, uh, this uh, theta to zero, you get a projector. No, oh, okay. You, well, so not projector, the permutation. Mm -hmm. Well, this is normal, right? Uh, yes. Okay, so did some, I mean, if you do fusion, for instance, I mean, is there any difference with SU1 slash 1? I mean, I'm just curious, I mean, if it's SU1, okay, it does, what type of symmetry is behind? Uh, uh, can anybody comment on? Yeah, so this is a relativistic version of, uh, so it's a contraction of the centrally extended SE1 slash 1 in ADS3. So it's it's not exactly SE1 slash 1, but there's some, um, some difference. Um, and yeah, we, we studied it with Bogdan and, and Bombardelli. We did the TBA of this in a paper in 16, I guess, 2016. 18 maybe but um 18 sorry yeah but uh, uh, dima i mean there are no bound states here because uh, so i'm not sure why you're asking about fusion and such no i was asking about like things things like herota and uh, maybe tq relations mm -hmm. uh, so is it tq relations as the same for su1 slash one but maybe analytic properties are different uh the, my general question is, okay, I, you say, say the word SU1 slash 1, what type of TQ relation can I write down? Mm -hmm. This type of questions. I mean, so it's more like, a, I mean, it's SU1 slash 1 squared, really, that you need to make this happen, I think. That's the, the first sort of point, right, Alan? Yes, yes. This is just one part of the whole story, just, just one fundamental uh, R matrix. Then you have... Various but uh, I think you you'll be able to write down. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm I'm just trying to to catch up a little. This is the the massless guy, right? Yeah, you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. So, the you know you can you can if you don't know anything about the dispersion relation, then uh, this is just the, this R matrix is just a <sighs> quasi relativistic thing. So if you set k equal to zero here then it's just a relativistic uh, R matrix and with just a strange dispersion relation if you want. So it's about as conventional as you could get. It's just the, dis the physical dispersion relations a little weird, but that's, some, that's in any case some external input. One question, uh, please. Uh, how close is this model to Stinch Liouville? It should be close, it's the same group, yes, SL2. So I think, the, Ale, maybe correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but isn't, the, so we find that the, the, uh, this R matrix in the pure Ramon-Ramon case is a sine Gordon model at a particular yeah. value of beta. Hmm. Yeah, it's just n equal to supersymmetric point of sine Gordon, uh, at least part of it. So th this R of theta is, um, yeah. How could it be compatible with uh, non-compactness? The fact that you don't have the highest, you have the highest weight, but you don't have the lowest weight or vice versa. Sorry, can you ask? Uh, sure. Usually, if you, uh, it's, it's a non-compact model, yes? It is three. Yes, but sorry, this is not the whole ADS3. So we're talking, that's why I was asking, we're talking about just the massless modes of the ADS3 here. Yes. 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 Then yes. Then it becomes compact. Sorry? Then it yeah. Uh, well, uh, the bosons, the, the, at least the bosons, you have an intuition 
uh, for because they come from the, roughly speaking, uh, they come from the T4 direction, right? It should be a sort of analytic so, uh, continuation of XMZ, yes? Yeah, the, maybe. The that's, uh, like that. Yeah, so but what we found, what we found is that on the nose, uh, in the Ramon, pure Ramon Ramon case, on the nose, the R matrix is exactly that of sine Gordon at a special point of beta, where it corresponds, ma massless sine Gordon, where it corresponds to uh, just a free boson. Then why your B operators don't commute? That's well, this is that's in the second when you have this yeah. mixture of fluxes. But when you have the the pure one, the pure Ramon Ramon one, they commute. That's right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Maybe wait a little bit fast on that. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe sorry, I, I will I will shut up uh, 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 after this last comment. But the kind of curious thing is that when you turn on turn on this Ramon Ramon flux, um, oh, sorry, when you turn on the NSNS parameter k. So in other words. In the string theory, you've got some vesumino witten term at level K. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting because this very simple uh, relativistic difference form R matrix gets sort of twisted, as you can see here from, from this e to the 2 pi i k. And you've got these discrete e to the 2 pi i k's appearing. And just then it... What replaces this parameter Q in Z, <clears throat> yes? I don't know if it directly does. That would be sorry. I, I guess I don't. I don't know the the connection so closely to X X Z. I mean, it's just sine Gordon, and then some deformation of sine Gordon, mm -hmm. massless sine Gordon. So maybe we could figure out a bit more how it connects to X X Z. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, Juan. No, no worry. I already asked you about that. Because I knew you will, you'd know more about these models than me. So finally, the the great question: We are getting these determinants even on these weird and non-trivial models. Why do are we getting these determinants? Well, we are getting well. Even Andre and the and Stavnov and the others in their in their uh, QD form universal enveloping of GLN. They are getting determinants in the norm of on cell beta vectors. So there, there should be something behind that. And the idea by Beliard and Slavnov was okay, let me take a set of n rapidities that fulfill the beta equation and a set of n plus one arbitrary complex numbers. And I'm going to define this uh, on cell off cell scalar product. This one that, that Gromov doesn't like. Let's go with them. And I'm going to compute this, uh, this C with the transfer matrix in the, in the middle and the B. So the transfer matrix can act on the C operator. And because this fulfills the beta equation, I only get the, the eigenvalue times the scalar product. Uh, that's something I forgot. Did you notice that I have one ra uh, n rapidities that fulfill the beta equation, but n plus one complex numbers. So I'm going to compute the scalar product between this state that fulfills the beta equation and this, where I'm erasing one of the rapidities. So I'm going to take, I'm going to construct n plus one of these scalar products, each uh, erasing one of these uh, arbitrary complex numbers. So I have only n parameters here instead of n plus one. So sorry, sorry why is not zero? Uh, this is on, uh, this is on cell of cell. So no, but I mean, it's like, uh, I mean, number of magnets, total number of uh, like spins is not. Yeah, that's, is the, that's why this is uh, this n and this is also n because I'm uh, taking one of them because I'm taking a set of n plus one arbitrary complex numbers in the set of n. So I have n here and n here. Ah, you're dropping one of u's. Okay. Yes, I'm dropping one of the u's. So I have n u's here instead of n plus one. And I'm going to construct this n plus one different scalar products. So the transfer matrix, uh, the C are an eigenstate of the transfer matrix, so they get this eigenvalue. But these Bs are not an eigenstate of these of the transfer matrix. So instead, I'm going to 
uh, when I commute these A's and this, which depends on the EJ, through these B's, if it goes in a wanted way, I'm going to still get these B's, but if they go in an unwanted way, uh, this EUJ is going to substitute one of the EUs here. So at the end, I'm going to take, I'm going to get a linear combination of all these n plus one uh, scalar products here. But consistency tells us that if we want to apply the transfer matrix to the right, to the left or to the right, I should get the same answer. So at the end, I can write this uh, si uh, system of li uh, this homogeneous system of linear equation that this scalar product should satisfy. And the idea, the argument that uh, Samuel and Slavnot say is that uh, if a, so a solution, if it exists, it means that this matrix here, this M, should have determinant e zero, then it should be written in terms of the determinants of minors of this M matrix. And also the, the, the good thing behind this, uh, this idea that this L only depends on the, the can construct this L, which is the linear combination here, from residues of the eigenvalue. So you don't have to explicitly construct your states for this method to apply. In principle, you can generalize this to, to cases where you don't have a zero vacuum, like eight vertex model or something like that. So mainly that's the idea where, why we are getting these, uh, these determinants. At least when you have a uh, scalar proofs that are on, between on cell and off cell, it's because they have to satisfy this kind of uh, of linear of homogeneous linear system of equations. And you can check what happens in the six vertex model, where the lam where the lambda, the eigenvalue is just this g times a linear combination of symmetric polynomials. And you can prove that this actually, the columns of this M uh, can be, one of the columns can be written as the linear combination of the other columns, proving that the determinant of this M in the six vertex model is indeed zero. And with that, for example, you can rewrite your system of equations in terms of this omega, which is a weird determinant of of the derivative of the i of the uh, of the eigenvalue, and get exactly that your scalar plots should be determinants of this function when you of this matrix when you erase one of the columns because this is an n times n plus one matrix. And more or less, that's the that's their argument to say that to explain more or less the reason why they are getting determinants. I hope I conveyed it well uh, somewhat. I don't know. So I think that's more or less what I wanted to say. So basically, to conclude, uh, computing a scalar approach is mostly, as you have seen in, my, in the example of the massless relativistic ideas, solving recurrence relations. <laughs> and this composite model trick, it allows you to, uh, to write very, very easily the, well, with some little bit of work, you can write these uh, recurrence relations for your scalar products. And finally, uh, I want to re I want to tell that linear algebra is telling that more that a on cell of cell scalar products uh, should be written in terms of determinants. So I think that's more or less what I wanted to say. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions for Juan Miguel? Um, so basically, you 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 do not discuss about the SU three uh, case. Uh, no, <laughs> just regarding to your abstract. <laughs> but uh, I can understand. Did I write something about the SU three in the abstract? Uh, maybe I will. Uh, it's my obsession about the SU three. That's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you read the SU2 as SU3.
No, even oh, beyond just you two. Yeah, maybe uh, <laughs> I misunderstand. Beyond, well, I won't. I won't be on this YouTube with this SU one slash one. So <laughs> yeah, I see. And I comment a little bit on this G GLN, a little bit, very tangentially. Yeah, and, and that's the paper of Taras of uh, maybe in uh, in Varshenko in '94 uh, that uh, shows uh, the norm of uh, GLN also. And uh, the KZ equations, they, they, introduced, they, they did a lot of things, but more in mathematical point of view. And the paper is quite hard to, to read, I admit. But, uh, and uh, even for the um, question of completeness, uh, I myself not sure about what, if it's true or not, but it seems they say that under um, condition, uh, they prove completeness. But if someone understands what uh, Basili say, uh, well, Dima is a specialist in completeness now, right? He's a <laughs> well, next week I'm going to speak about this. Okay, nice. Oh. We'll be there. Mm -hmm. And how about just this uh, this way we we obtain this uh, this grammar that uh, method, the uh, linear equation. It was quite uh, the key point is to have the the action of the of the transfer matrix on the beta vector. And in rely uh, about representation theory because you you need to to be able to show that the t action gives a wanted and wanted term, and uh, and doing this so for SL three it's still not clear because we don't have linear algebra anymore. We have some complex things that we could not uh, understand for the moment. But uh, it was quite funny to to see that this uh, whole story of uh, at least for SU two uh, and in many cases of model, it's just we are stupid to don't see this. Uh, just uh, yeah, because at the end, it's something, uh, it's something very very simple. It's just yeah, yeah, if you write this way, you get a, a homogeneous linear equation. For me, it was surprising that nobody realized that before. So for us, you two, you have two statements. First is that determinant of this matrix is zero. And then yeah. second is that solution of the system is itself a determinant of a bit different form. You no, know, this is consequence of Kramer rules. And uh, if you can say that the determinant is uh, the determinant rank is n, so this is not uh, obvious to prove, but uh, the determinant uh, should be zero. But you, in Kramer uh, theorem for linear algebra, you should also show that the rank is n. And in this case, you have only one solution, it's good. And this to show that the rank is n is not already really done, but we just can reproduce the formula. And and we, my my first question is not for this, um, is for what uh, when you have uh, you don't have u one symmetry, you could not use all the recursion relation uh, that is again Karepin developed. That's what you present, and that it's also in part in the book uh, of Isagin Karepin. And uh, basically, because you don't have I guess West property, and uh, we try many way to using this uh, sum over partition. And at the end, this way it's very simple. And now we 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 should prove, uh, uh, for example, for x x z with generic open boundary condition. This is something we should finish uh, when I finish calculation. But uh, we have the result. But it's just a question of. Uh, it's direct when you have this. You just need to have the action of transfer matrix on the beta vector and uh, to show that the determinant is zero of this matrix and then assume that the rank is n to say that you have one only one unique solution. And then after it just uh, linear algebra. But wait, it's a bit confusing. If you say it's one solution and the system is homogeneous, then the solution has to be zero. It's a bit... Uh... No, the determinant of the matrix should be uh, zero. Oh, okay, so there is, okay, I see. Yeah, and there then is. the rank should be M. One solution is one dimensional space solution. Uh, but this... Uh, Just a small comment. Uh, yeah, because you know, this matrix is N plus one times N plus one. Yeah, yeah, yes. So small comment, this type of equation is very actually similar to what we get for uh, SUN case with Robert and Andrea for uh, this construction from uh, Baxter equation, uh, which also gives some non-trivial correlators. And also give some prediction for the norm, which was like then confirmed from SLV perspective for SUN case. 
And in, in which paper is it this? Because uh, I should... Uh, yeah, maybe further, can you uh, insert link uh, to, to the chat? It's okay. I will send it to Samuel, but also I will send it to the chat now. Okay, thanks. Well, I probably disagree with Kole, uh, because to me it's as similar as linear algebra is universal. Is what? Uh, it's only similar because linear algebra is universal too. Yeah, well, in both cases it gives a uh, determinant, uh, which is a scalar product. Yes, determinant is an important tool of linear algebra indeed. And so be good is also determined exactly for the, by the same logic of linear algebra. I mean, is it formal as the term for be good, which based exactly on the same arguments. But I cannot say that it's the same analogy. I'm not saying it is the same, I'm just saying... Uh... <laughs> yeah. We just do a linear algebra. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's a joke that Nikita told me uh, just before we find this, that mathematician uh, laugh of us because we just make linear algebra and for mathematician everything is proven in alge linear algebra. <laughs> And so at the end, you arrive, we arrive to this thing, <laughs> and, uh, and they're right. But uh, yeah, but for for SU three, it should be a, it's really more complex. And basically, the fact that the offshell action of the transfer matrix that you can find in the paper we did with um, in two thousand twelve uh, about SU three. There's a paper by Michael Wheeler that used this action to find integral uh, formula for scalar product. And with, uh, but there's no continuation about this work and it's not clear how to, to compute the pole. But uh, in fact, you have to, because you have two set of rapidities for um, uh, the first set and second set of uh, SU3 uh, better equation and sometimes you are so you don't have exactly the same number of uh, the good number of uh, of equation and uh, it seems that counting the number of equation you should have a very bigger uh, determinant and, uh, and for the moment we 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 have no real uh, continuation of this for for higher rank so maybe just specific to su2 so i don't know Actually, uh, Michael Wheeler told me that uh, he knows that this is not a determinant for rank uh, more than one. Yeah, maybe. Uh, and uh, <laughs> why? <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the first? Well, why? Uh, what uh, are the, his argument about that? No, no, even um, statement. He did it. He checked it analytically. Oh, no, sorry, um, um, uh, numerically. Yeah, yeah, but at, at the same know. time, we, we disproved the statement because we actually compute the SUN correlators, which are ratios of determinants. So. <laughs> well, ratios of determinants, but not determinants. No, oh, because correlators is uh, over norm, right? Yeah. Expectation value over norm. Yeah, I don't know. How can you check numerically if some number is a determinant? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. He, he, he do symbolic calculation, I just, uh, but after, if you have some huge sum, you can uh, sometimes find determinant and <laughs> what you put in your, in your matrix, it's not clear. Okay. Uh, all right, so any more questions? If not... Uh, my, my big caller, just want to, to, to Juan, uh, if he's still here. Yes. Uh, I think one of the points which was related to this initial discussion was uh, splitting and having instead of you know, other type of determinants. Uh, if, if you pick up, so you have three combinations essentially for uh, for the B and C, C and B, uh, with the offshell and onshell. But uh, getting back to I think to to, to what Kole was saying, suppose uh, if you if you take a different basis or or is there uh, any other reasoning uh, that you would fail with uh, C and B good? For example, can if you proceed with these ones, can you still do this uh, uh, spin chain splitting with, which you were doing in the middle? Well, I don't know if you if I split in the B good or what, what, uh, why what, so essentially why exactly these three combinations is preferable? I think I think maybe I like well because well, 
Yeah. yeah, what they get is the sum over partition of the initial bit rules. If you do yes. this, uh, then uh, the number of magnets is not preserved. Uh, so probably you get uh, unrestricted sum or I don't know, something else. So no, you have to work it out basically, no one done it. Yeah, but, the, but why you can't work this out? That's my point because there was no like strict why if you if you pick up the spaces why you can proceed with this I mean, you still get the partition many, many many simple open questions no one looks at I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So let's. Uh, I actually it's Andre. Andre. Hi. <laughs> Okay, yeah, well, thanks, Juan Miguel. Thank you very much for uh, preparing an introductory overview talk. Yeah, thank you to, to you and the other organizers to allow me to talk. Do we okay. have the, the next speaker? Ah, Dima is the next speaker. Yeah. Dima. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dima, do you want to tell us something about uh, uh, what you will discuss next week? Trailer. Yeah, so. So, so trailer. So next week I will uh, discuss with you proof of completeness of bit equations. I mean the normal bit equations that you all know. And uh, so one thing it will be like rigorous mathematical proof. So no, I mean we will of course make general position statement first, but the point that the proof will be like like it's rigorous mathematical, not in general position, but for any values of parameters. Do we need to have some prerequisites, some analysis books you recommend before? <laughs> um, well, uh, check uh, if you know what is ideal, for instance, it would be useful. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, so like a quotient algebra ideal, I will try to explain, but if you just look at it. Maybe before, you can send a few Wikipedia articles for pedestrians. <laughs> no, so our article is actually written. Uh, That's cool, but happy. So, in our article, there is an appendix which is called uh, Vronsky Algebra with Pedestrian Approach. So. Could you give archive number? Uh, yes. Well, okay, yes, I have one more. You're right in the chat. Okay, so thanks everyone for joining us today. We still have a few capacity, a few places if you want to enjoy friend, invite friends. So, do that. And hopefully, see you next week when Dima will speak about the article he will paste in the chat. He just did now. Okay, thank you. Bye. Oh, thank you. Bye. Bye. Send Bye. us ideas for talks and tell us if you want to give a talk. Bye.